is a problem that uh, arises frequently in clinical practice almost every day. There's patients with ischemic heart disease, they need uh, non-cardiac surgery and uh, always we get a phone call what to do with this medication. And Thank you very much for the introduction. It is my pleasure to present the results of the studies on behalf of my co-investigators. So a little bit about the background in our study. So in the United States as well as internationally, over the last two get decades, there have been more and more patients undergoing orthopedic surgery. Now, in the case of orthopedic surgery, there's little data in the literature on both thrombotic and bleeding complications. There have been studies looking at thrombotic events as well as bleeding events, but only one prior study has looked at both. Now, similarly, the majority of the studies in the past have looked at uh, thrombotic and bleeding events in the setting of cardiac versus non-cardiac surgery, and the non-cardiac surgery were specifically the majority of times in vascular surgery, which is a high-risk population. We therefore wanted to see in the setting of a more intermediate risk population what the incidence of these complications were. So you can see, to just start off with the results of our study, this is the incidence of adverse events in the overall population. You can see here myocardial necrosis, which, just to, important to note, this is different from myocardial infarction. We use myocardial necrosis as any troponin elevation, while coded myocardial infarction was the ICD-9 coding from the physician. Now you can see that there's approximately a 6% incidence of myocardial necrosis in the perioperative setting, while only 0.6% for a myocardial infarction. For major bleeding, there were similar statistics. There was 5.4% for major bleeding, which was defined according to the International Society on Thrombo Thrombosis and Hemostasis Guidelines. And the majority of the patients that had major bleeding were requiring a two, more than two units of transfusion of blood. Now, coded bleeding were also done by ICD-9 coding by the physician. And given that, you could see that there is a, a decreased uh, number of bleeding here. And lastly, the incidence of stroke is 0.1%. We then wanted to assess the independent predictors of having myocardial necrosis as well as major bleeding. So we included here just the five, five uh, baseline factors here that did have a significant uh, prediction of having myocardial necrosis. Now, according to here, you could see that for age, coronary artery disease, and cancer all had the highest WALD score. And that shows that they were, out of this group, they were the highest predict, the strongest predictors of having myocardial necrosis. Similarly, we did the same for major bleeding. And this shows a walled score of, for the top three, cancer, female sex, and, and coronary artery disease, again, were the strongest predictors. Now, it's important to note, when looking at all five in each case of myocardial necrosis and in bleeding, coronary artery disease, cancer, and peripheral vascular disease all were independent predictors of having both a myocardial necrosis as well as having major bleeding. Knowing that subjects with coronary artery disease were at an increased incidence of having both uh, perioperative complications, we therefore wanted to stratify the, the patients with coronary disease to better understand the magnitude of the difference. So here you can see for coronary artery disease versus no coronary artery disease, there was a significantly higher incidence of subjects having myocardial necrosis, 19% with CAD and only 4% without CAD. Similarly, we did the same with the ISTH-defined bleeding, and you could see subjects with coronary disease had an incidence of major bleeding at 10%, compared to only approximately 5% without. And again, these results also were statistically significant. So just to go over a few of the, the important facts that we took away from the study is first that we showed that there was an incidence of greater than 5% in both thrombotic and bleeding complications in the overall population undergoing an intermediate risk surgery. Now, knowing patients' baseline demographics, coronary disease, cancer, and peripheral vascular disease all were independent predictors of having both thrombotic and bleeding events. We showed that age, which was greater than 65, and chronic kidney disease also predicted thrombotic complications and female sex and COPD were independent predictors of having bleeding. There was a low use of aspirin in subjects with coronary artery disease, 
only 7.6% of subjects who were undergoing orthopedic surgery were maintained on aspirin within 30 days of surgery. <laughs> Given that there were 327 patients with coronary disease out of the 3,083 subjects that we initially looked at, and only 7% of these subjects were on aspirin, there was a very low, uh, very low number of subjects on aspirin, and therefore, uh, we believe this is why there is no significant association between aspirin use and thrombotic and bleeding complications. And lastly, further studies will be needed to better understand this trade-off in the perioperative setting of thrombotic and bleeding complications following orthopedic surgery. Okay, thank you. Any questions, comments? Any proposal, uh, Dr. Uh, advice uh, for using uh, in such a surgery uh, aspirin or other medications? Uh, have you some specific recommendation? Now, with the use of antiplatelets, again, we showed that there was a trend towards, but there was no significant association, so we cannot for sure say that there is any benefit or no benefit to the use of antiplatelet agents in subjects undergoing orthopedic surgery. It, it more seems that we need to take away that the patient's baseline risk factors and what increases their risk, and therefore it's more physician uh, choice of which patient should be continued on aspirin. But it is important to know that there was no significant association with bleeding either. So that's important. That, that's what we would probably take away from here. What, what are the procedures at the moment for orthopedic surgery? Do they vary between different countries in Europe? The, the type of orthopedic surgery? For, yeah, for, for giving um, anticoagulants or not anti antiplatelets. We used, in our study here, we looked at all spine, knee, and hip surgeries from 2008 to 2009 um, at two academic institutions in New York. So this was specifically looking at just spine, knee, and hip procedures. Um, are, are you asking if there are different procedures yeah, in? Well, presumably it's all up to the orthopedic surgeon what's being prescribed, is it? Right, of whether or not to continue someone on the antiplatelet agent, yes. There are no guidelines. No, and that's what it, it seems. The reason we wanted to do this was because even the definition, I pointed out we use the ISTH guidelines of what's defined as bleeding, but there have been no real studies in the past that have looked at what should be the guidelines of continuing medications. It's all kind of assessing risk factors and making the best judgment of the physician. And that's why we undertook this to try to show that, not try to show, but to see whether or not there was an incidence of having bleeding with the use of aspirin in subjects undergoing orthopedic surgery. So I just wondered what happens in Europe. Does anybody know in terms of what yeah. happens with uh, orthopedic surgery? In most countries, I think is that uh, the orthopedic surgeons are using low, low molecular weight heparin, but they are more focusing on the prevention of uh, deep venous thrombosis and the prevention of lung embolism, but thereby forgetting that most of this, their patients have ischemic heart disease and that low molecular weight heparins do not protect against the thrombosis in smaller arteries uh, being the coronary arteries and and most surgeons they are uh, unbelievably afraid from the use of uh, aspirin and moreover also from uh, diclopidin and clopidogrel and they want to be uh, to, they always ask us to stop it uh, one or two weeks beforehand and uh, because they are so afraid of the bleeding complications of the other agents. But, uh, but this study really uh, shows us that this is an unmet need uh, and that we need uh, more information what is the best antithrombotic therapy perioperatively uh, to protect uh, the patients both from deep venous thrombosis and uh, ischemic heart uh, disease. And th that's a very good point that in, in all uh, all studies in the literature that have been done in the past that do assess bleeding complications have all been comparing different uh, mm -hmm. heparin versus anoxaparin versus Coumadin, more of preventative for uh, deep vein thrombosis. And it's very rare that any study, th there are no studies that have looked at more of the incidence of bleeding in subjects with aspirin 
at, not from a perspective of assessing for pulmonary emboli and for DVTs. Mm -hmm. It could be that the direct uh, thrombin inhibitors could be a good alternative because they block both the formation of uh, clots in, in the veins, but they also inhibit platelet aggregation and thereby preventing clot formation in the coronary arteries. Do you have any comment on that? Or? No, I, I, I think uh, uh, as soon as uh, my advice is uh, concerned, I, I will uh, recommend and discourage, discourage to stop aspirin in, in stable patients with uh, surgery and uh, only discussing with surgeries, a certain type of surgery, high risk of bleeding, uh, I will accept to stop aspirin, but uh, certainly uh, we have to discourage. The problem is different if the patient has received recently a uh, drug editing stand with dual antiplatelate agents. In this uh, setting, maybe the use of a uh, uh, direct thrombin inhibitor can be really helpful, maybe intravenously uh, to have a bridge for surgery or something like this, we can imagine. But it's a very important topic and very uh, uh, coming from the real world and the clinical practice is very important. So maybe we can conclude that we heard uh, several unmet needs. Uh, we need uh, better diagnosis of, uh, or faster diagnosis of uh, acute MI. Just we need uh, better antithrombotics that have we, several presentations uh, have been dealing with this uh, topic. And uh, if we are using uh, antiplatelet agents, maybe there could be an advantage in monitoring platelet aggregation. And from the fast MI registry, we have worrying results about the use of mulcidomine, a medication that maybe in France is not used frequently, but in other countries of Europe is uh, one of the standard uh, anti-anginal therapies. Uh, and uh, we also learned this, that uh, there is also one of the unmet needs in ischemic heart disease is just the better implementation of this, the, the therapies that we know that they improve this uh, clinical outcome, uh, both short-term and long-term. Interesting presentations from all the presenters, and I thank them for their presentations. Thank you.